Happy New Year. It is 2024. It's hard to believe, but the, the future is upon us. And the Douglas County Homeless Initiative had a phenomenal uh, year, a phenomenal 2023. So I know today we're going to begin with our 2023 year end review, um, followed by a discussion with AD Works. AD Works, thank you so much for being here with us today. We certainly appreciate your uh, presence here with us here at the table. Um, following uh, AD Works, there'll be a conversation with Secor Cares. And then the Douglas has heart check distribution. We do have another uh, check distribution through our um, our uh, handouts don't help campaign, which is just uh, fantastic. Um, we'll do a bit of a heart update with Tiffany, as always. Um, executive committee member updates, followed by public comment, and then some closing comments. So with that, uh, thank you, and let's start with our 2023 year-end review. Actually, Nicole and Deputy Sanchez, if you could start us off, kick us off with that. Yes, definitely. Thanks for having us. Um, I'm Nicole Beckett. And I'm Deputy Sanchez. Uh, Lieutenant Taylor Davis. And we're here to present on reintegration. I think we have slides to show as well for our group in the jail. So um, in the jail, we have a reintegration program. Uh, we have definitely a lot of subspecialties in the jail um, that uh, target <clears throat> our inmates anywhere from substance use to mental health disorder, uh, helping our veterans, helping um, folks that are homeless get services connected to services while they're in custody. So hopefully when they leave, they don't come back to us. Um, I think the very first slide shows our team. Um, we've grown extensively in the past year alone. Um, we're continually adding different positions. Uh, we operate out of two different grants, our Correctional Treatment Board grant, as well as our JBBS, so that's our Jail-Based Behavioral Services. Um, we have our SUD, our JMAT services that we'll talk about a little bit later, and our competency. So many of our inmates come in uh, homeless that are severely, persistently mentally ill. Um, so we have a separate case manager that targets that. Um, from that, we also pair a lot through DHS. We have several uh, members of DHS uh, helping us do Medicaid eligibility. So inmates leave with health insurance and food assistance leaving, which is phenomenal. Um, definitely targeting from that whole person uh, approach. Uh, they got to have health insurance to go to their appointments and stay healthy. Um, also, we have in the works a care compact uh, case manager working with our team. So hopefully we'll get that hired in 2024, which is phenomenal. And we also have somebody from AD Works on our team that comes in to do employment workshops in the jail. Laura, Laura. And then you... reintegration deputy. So up on the slide, you all can read what my duties are. Um, <clears throat> Over the course of the last year since I became the reintegration deputy, I've transported over 144 inmates out of the jail. Probably 75% of those have been homeless population. Um, they've gone to sober livings, homeless shelters across as far up as Fort Collins and as far south as Colorado Springs all along the way. Um, and then also to the RTD. So there are some inmates who definitely don't want any help, even though they're offered some things. So we do try to help them get out of Castle Rock since the nearest light rail is 10.4 miles from the jail. I've assisted in six mental health holds that includes M1s and .5s. And then we have done community checks. Um, so the clinicians that we have from JBBS, the SUD clinicians, we go out and try to make contact with people uh, that have released from the jail. Um, we have visited homeless shelters, uh, uh, treatment communities, sober livings, and then also homes of people. We also, because I work Tuesday through Friday and I'm only one person, we have started using uh, lift concierge in the jail for people releasing so that we can help assist them get out of the jail. There is some caveats to that. Um, if they are releasing and they have any mental health issues, we do try to assist them with a deputy uh, transporting them. I would say probably 80% of those 75 lift, lift 
transports are homeless people. They don't have a place that they're going. They oftentimes are couch surfing. And gel medicated assisted treatment. So we call it JMAT. The J is just fancy that we put in in front of MAT services. Um, we are now fully uh, FDA approved offering all of those medications in the jail. As of July 1st, we were starting to offer methadone services. Um, that was fairly new for us here in Douglas. Um, but now we are offering Suboxone, Naltrexone, Vivitrol, um, Subutex, and as well as methadone. Um, a lot of times, especially with the fentanyl crisis occurring, a lot of inmates come in uh, withdrawing from heroin, fentanyl, and we have to get them help and services. So this, these actually are our stats from last year. I have not updated them. We had over 400 folks on Suboxone. So whether that's continuing uh, treatment or inducting on treatment, which is phenomenal. Um, we're also offering methadone. I believe we had 20 clients since July 1st on methadone alone. Um, a lot of our services, we don't just start them and say, okay, good luck on it. We are offering them treatment upon release. So trying to set up those appointments, holding uh, workshops in custody, uh, giving vouchers upon release so they're able to pick them up at our local pharmacy uh, so they can continue their MAT services as well as have a provider in the community. Um, JMAT is a huge extensive thing. I don't see it uh, going anywhere. If anything, it's growing. So we're continuing to build our MAT program in the jail. If you wanna move forward to the next slide. So moving forward in 2024, some things that we're looking to do is add additional reintegration deputies that will help us be able to assist our population better. Um, broadening custody protect, and for those that don't know what custody protect is, it's essentially um, inmates that wear almost like an Apple watch. We can hook it to their wrist or their ankle that monitors um, their stats while in jail that are coming off of different um, drugs. And then building and strengthening collaborative partners as the 23rd Judicial District uh, commences and begins to come up. Does anybody have any questions for any of us? I really commend you on the, the medical assistant treatment. I didn't know that. Um, I probably should have known that, but I didn't know that. How do you discharge someone who starts the medication in the jail and maybe isn't going to a sober living program? How do you help them transition back to the community and stay on that medication? Definitely, um, it's not easy. Uh, there is a village of us to help in this. Uh, Wellpath is our medical vendor in the jail. So I think from the start, as soon as they're inducted, they're given a packet of how they can connect yeah. to their community provider. Um, we really encourage that, that they help start forming their plan upon release right then and there. Um, a lot of our inmates and clients and patients on JMAT don't release to Douglas County. And not having a methadone clinic that we routinely work with, it's outside of Douglas County. Um, but through that, we have community partners that we're referring to other MAP programs. All Health Network has a MAP program that we work with. Um, we're trying to set up those appointments and have those workshops in custody. So they're already saying, okay, how am I gonna continue this upon release? Um, so it's definitely not a one-stop shop. You have this med, good luck. It's definitely not like that at all. Uh, we have an extensive JBBS, JMAP program. That's a six week course to go over um, harm reduction, coping skills, um, going over how to, <clears throat> Narcan usage and to help with um, withdrawal and how to spot it in your friends. Um, so we're very thinking forward of how can we reduce this? Um, but there's no easy way to set up appointments, especially in jail where we don't know when somebody's gonna release. So it's kind of, you have to work for yourself. Definitely give us a call. We'll help you get to a provider. Thank you. One quick last question. And uh, Medicaid covers all of those medications upon release? 
Yes. Um, upon release, uh, they won't have Medicaid in the jail. So it's definitely well path in the jail uh, services in custody. Uh, grant helps pay for that. Um, but upon release, Medicaid will cover. Thank you. I have a couple of questions too. This is Kirk Wilson with Lone Tree PD. Two questions. The first one is um, with a lot of the folks we're contacting, the fentanyl use is like 20, 25 pills a day. So what I'm curious about is without this treatment, what would that look like if they're in the jail? And what, what does that withdrawal look like if you weren't given them this treatment? And then the second question is, how does this compare to the other jails on the front range? Um, withdrawal for opiates is very messy. Um, it is not pretty in the jail. Um, Matt is, I would say, extensively helped um, our staff treat those that are going through withdrawal because a lot of times when they come in fentanyl, they do have a withdrawal process before we can connect them to methadone or suboxone, um, but it's safer. It's a lot safer for our um, inmates coming off and it's less of a mess to clean up as well. Um, as far as, do you wanna to touch on the second piece? As far as the other jails, um, Douglas County is kind of unique. We have programs and the JBBS program is something that doesn't really exist in the rest of the state. They all have JBBS programs, but none of them look Deputy quite Sanchez. like ours does. Can you move up a little so everyone Absolutely. can hear? Thank none you. of them look quite like ours does. So um, each one, each jail is given, is connected into JBBS and um, are allowed to set up and utilize their services how they choose. So we're kind of unique and it's, it's actually been um, eye-opening for me coming from working in the 18th, but I worked a lot with Arapahoe County to see how we're doing things, which is very, very different in the wraparound services that we give when people are releasing, which is helping people, um, one, make some different connections with law enforcement, two, just stay connected so that we can help keep them sober, which is phenomenal. And I think, I think if they're reporting to you that it's 20 to 25 fentanyl pills, almost everybody that I've transported, we, we talk about their usage. Um, that's extremely low. A lot of them are anywhere from 50 to 150 pills a day. So when we're talking about that, that is, ex that's, that's an extensive use, right? And, and just so you know, with the MAT program, when they release from MAT, they are given a voucher for seven days. So we're not expecting them to go out and just find someone because they start going through withdrawal and then that causes usage. But they're given a voucher or if I'm transporting and I know they're releasing, I run over and pick up their meds for them. So they're, they're given a seven day supply of whatever use that they're on, whether it's a, Suboxone or Naltrexone or whatnot. And they're also given Narcan upon release because many of them will go back out and they don't go get connected, but start to use again. So we're giving them something to help prevent some of the overdoses as well. Well, I just want to say uh, tremendous thanks to, uh, to all of you, to Nicole and Deputy Sanchez and the team. Um, it, part of the original vision with the Homeless Initiative working with the reintegration uh, team was really born out of a conversation with Castle Rock. And I'm really pleased to have Mayor Gray here with us as always. You're so good to uh, spend time at the county and, and work on some of these bigger issues. But um, we often heard from Castle Rock about uh, our, our returning citizens uh, literally just being let out and, and headed uh, you know, under a bridge or into our public spaces. And part of what we are trying to do is reclaim our public spaces and compassionately provide people transition services um, towards self-sufficiency. And you all are doing such a phenomenal job of that. So thank you for your presentation and for being part of this group. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for these guys? Oh, more, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, one, I just want to thank you guys very much. I, I uh, lost a cousin to overdose, and I think it's, it's easy for us um, onlookers who, who, who don't have somebody in your family who um, has abused uh, uh, either medications or, or any kind of drug that, to, for us to judge and sit there and say, you know, why are, bless you, uh, why are they um, like that or whatever that kind of stuff. And, and, uh, I just, I wish that this kind of program was available for my cousin at, at that time. I do appreciate it. Very, you guys, it's very hard work. Thank you.
Thank you for sharing that. Commissioner Thomas. When I served as the coroner, a regular death that we responded to was someone who had been released from custody after a period of time and they used, but they used the level they had been using before they went to jail and it was too much and they overdosed. And that was a regular death that we investigated even here in Douglas County. With that in mind, do you have any idea about your success rate when people are in the JMAP program? Does it help them stay clean or is there any way to track what that looks like on success? That's a good question. Uh, two years ago, I actually ran a small recidivism rate of just our JMAC clients. So that was back when we didn't have methadone. We just had Suboxone and Naltrexone in the jail. Uh, recidivism rates during that time were tremendously low from the national level as well as the Colorado level. Um, running recidivism, it always is such a great terminology and a great thing to say, but actually running the criminal histories of all of those people is really extensive. Um, so it's a very small sample. Um, I think it was 46% was our recidivism rate for those on JMAT, which 46, that sounds really high, but compared to the national level and Colorado level, yeah, that's great success. Um, it helps them just even in jail having a moment of sobriety and then packing with different groups and classes and, oh, how do you use Narcan? And, oh, I can't use the same level upon release than I did when I was out prior. Um, it's eye-opening, and I think a lot of them don't know the ramifications of their actions, um, but as well as our team instills hope. Um, I think having that support system of our huge team is monumental, where maybe they don't have family members that support them in their decisions. Um, I think all of those things coming at once is such a success in jail, because it gives them a, a time out of thinking about what else can we do differently. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments on this? Thank you so much. How about a huge round of applause for our reintegration? It's me. Um, I, I've heard Dan McKelkey from Human Services. I've reported on goals, I think, for the last three years, and I, I wish I could say that we're started goals, um, but we haven't. Uh, uh, the funds were finally, from the federal government, the funds were finally released in April of last year, and as our funds were released, we had a pretty significant environmental issue um, when we were, were going through HUD for these funds. And so Family Tree had to do a a subsequent environmental um, scan of the property in order to start construction on our uh, dorm. And with that, they found some environmental issues that took a really long time for us to, to work through. So I'm happy to say that that has been done um, in preliminary construction. Everything with this pro, uh, everything with the program has to be RFP. So we had to RFP for, or they had to RFP for a, a contractor and an architect. The architect is done and the contractor is in process. We um, believe, Jen and I are actually going there in two weeks. We believe that they will have started construction when we come. So hopefully in the spring, we will be ready to go with um, families moving into goals. Next slide, please. I'm happy to say that uh, from our sign campaign that we have put up almost 70 signs um, across the county. Um, and as we're seeing an, another check being distributed today, obviously we're getting um, really good usage out of our, our signs. So we're happy to talk about um, the success. And if you drive around Douglas County, which I do, because I also live here, you see them pretty regularly. And in the spots where you see those signs, I no longer see panhandlers. Next slide, please. And again, as we're um, giving out um, some uh, one more check today, uh, it looks like our total contributions, as you can see up there, from those signs is almost $9,000, I like to round up, 8,500. <laughs> it does. <laughs> so we, we consider this a great success, and it's also helping build um, our nonprofit partners 
um, ability to serve the, the people that they need to serve through these dollars. So we're pretty excited about what we accomplished in 2023. I'm gonna turn it over to Wendy. Well, and before you do that, any questions for Dan? Uh, that's really great news. And I think it's through the partnership we have with the Community Foundation that those signs, it says right on there, give to your you know, trusted Community Foundation, DCCF, and you can roll those funds out immediately. So thank you. Uh, moving on to Wendy Holmes, communications. Good morning. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, is this on? Hello, hello. Thank you. Well, good morning. Um, I'm here to report on the communication C of the four C's um, over 2023. As you start to absorb the details on this one slide, there's just one slide for me today. I want to say that what you're looking at is the work of the full communication and public affairs department of Douglas County, our staff. It is, it is uh, what's absent from this slide is the work of Lone Tree and Castle Rock and Parker and Highlands Ranch, um, Castle Pines, everyone else, all the other communication professionals who shared the same information we pushed out in their electronic newsletters, in their social media, and in other ways. So I want to be sure that as we look at this, everyone gets full credit for um, this work. Um, let's start with digital ad impressions as part of our media buy with Colorado Community Media. The six newspapers that have web pages um, in that publisher uh, website, we run digital ads. So you can see here that the impressions from the ads, which are click-through ads, to the homeless initiative web section on our website, 489, almost 490,000 impressions. And impressions is how many times the content has been viewed. So how many times, all right? Our email subscribers went up from 395 in 2022 to 622. That means that whenever we push out news in our online newsroom, folks have said, we want to get it first. That's what that means. That when we push out news, generally, we also push it out to this affinity group that said, show me what you're doing with the homeless initiative. Media mentions, um, you know, they're hard to measure, but we do have the clips. Uh, this is a lot of television coverage that happened in 2023 uh, in all of the network affiliates um, in Denver. Um, the, the meetings, the 11 meetings that you had last year are posted on the, on the YouTube channel. So 818 views of those meetings that are posted there in the archives. 100, uh, 1,871 views of our newsroom posts. Uh, we run print advertising, a half page full color ad in all six of the Colorado community media newspapers that are distributed in Douglas County. One third of those ads featured the handouts don't help lower third uh, full color posts, the same information that's on the, the signs in the uh, community. Social media impressions, 161,000. There were four videos produced last year. Um, Commissioner Layden's uh, newsletters, uh, PSA on heart, and then we considered that press conference that we did, um, one of those views, uh, 1,106 views of that. And this is really interesting to me. Um, we lost the first quarter of our web views because we upgraded uh, our Google alerts. Um, but this 8,685 web visits, this is to the Homeless Initiative web pages. This is nine months, 965 page views a month. The second most visited page is the Douglas 
has heart page, which tells us the signs are working and tells us the result of that is the donations that have been received. So I guess, I guess it's working. Um, that's what I would say. <laughs> um, and if there's nothing else, uh, that's all I have today. Thank you. I guess that, that's a very humble uh, way to frame 490,000 digital ad impressions, my goodness. Um, but it, it does take a village. And um, you're right that the, the sea of communications, a lot of this work does not get accomplished unless people know about it. Um, and as we're seeing donations increase, I think that's a good reflection that the word is getting out. Any questions for Wendy? Okay, great job, Wendy. Jen Eby. Okay, next slide, please. So we're, uh, we wanted to definitely touch base on Hart and the accomplishments of uh, their team. So the first, I guess, graphic you see on the left there is a 36% reduction in unsheltered um, homeless. Mm -hmm. that, that really is uh, from the winter point in time count to the, of 2022 to the winter point in time count of 2023. Um, we attribute a lot of that work, a lot of that um, success in seeing a reduction in our unsheltered homeless uh, to the efforts of our heart team. So very um, encouraged to see that for sure. So the middle one is an engagement rate. And what you're looking at there is of the more than close to 1,400 referrals that Hart has gotten during 2023, uh, they were able to engage with 60% of those people, of those referrals. Um, I'm sure you can imagine that it's not always that easy to connect with people who are homeless, especially when they're responding to a referral that, that you know, is not always something they can go right to the scene. Sometimes it's, it's you know, they're responding after an hour or so or even after a weekend. Um, so 60% engagement rate we think is, is very, very good. Um, we also have experienced, I'm especially um, excited and, and proud about this, of the 226 people who were um, provided with services, 35% of them were able to be housed. Um, and that, that looks different for everybody, of course. You know, sometimes that is uh, somebody who is able to get into their own apartment or um, somebody going into a transitional sort of shelter or something like that. Sometimes it is re reconnecting with their support system, their natural support. So they go back with their family or friends or something like that. So that um, we think is a very encouraging number and a great indicator of the good work that the Heart team is doing. Um, next slide, please. We also wanted to give you an idea of where the referrals are coming from. So again, almost, well, 1,370 referrals were received during the 2023 year. So that's from January 2023 to December 2023. These are where the referrals are coming from by location. So 25% from Castle Rock, 26% from the Highlands Ranch area, 22% from Lone Tree, seven percent from Castle Rock, and then you know we have um, others coming from our more rural areas, and a small percentage coming from uh, Castle Pines. Um, and then also wanted to give you an idea of the type of services that they provide. So um, you can see that they are providing a tremendous amount of case management. Um, they reconnect with individuals um, honestly as much as they can. Um, but they do have a kind of a minimum standard that they're trying to connect with people. So you do see a lot on the case management side. Um, and then a lot of that other, those other services are really client dependent. So they're that individual working with the heart team, um, talking about the different types of services that they're interested in receiving. And that's when those other referrals are made. Okay, um, next slide. Um, so we also wanted to talk about the point in time count. Um, 
you have heard us talk about point in time quite a bit. Um, we do this twice a year. We did two counts in 2023. Uh, we always do the winter count, which is coming up at the end of January. Uh, and that is the official count that we're required to do um, as part of the Metro Denver Homeless Initiative. It's part of the HUD count. So that's the official point in time count that's done every winter. And as I said, we did see a 36% reduction in unsheltered homelessness from 2022 winter point in time count to 2023 winter point in time count. Um, we also wanted to point out that, um, as I said, we do two point in time counts and we feel like that's really important because the nature of homelessness does tend to be a bit seasonal. It does tend to change from winter to summer. And we wanted to have really a good understanding of what that looks like in the summer. Um, so the difference there is uh, and we, we did kind of expect to see essentially a, an increase in the summer because there is more transition happening among homeless people. Um, and you do, you know, experience more, more people who are more comfortable with staying outside just because the weather is warmer. Um, so we had 72 individuals that were experiencing homelessness in the winter point in time count. And then we had a total of 93 in the summer point in time count. Um, the unsheltered uh, point in time count went from 40 to 54. So we did see that more people were outside, were you know, um, taking advantage of, of the warmer weather essentially. But I also wanna point out the fact that our sheltered number from winter of 2023 to summer um, went actually up. And to me, I, I think that is a good indicator that we have the resources available to actually shelter people. So as our number went up, um, we, were you know, we were able to accommodate that. So I think that's an important point there as well. Um, and of course, the, the data is something that we're keeping a very close eye on. And I want to commend everyone that participates in the point in time count because they do a tremendous job. Um, our law enforcement partners, our heart team, our CRT team, um, they understand and have relationships built with our those who are unsheltered in our in our community. So they are able to go and connect with them on those point in time counts. And I think that has given us a really strong understanding of what the homeless, um, what homelessness looks like in Douglas County. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, and another thing that I think you've heard us talk quite a bit about uh, is Built for Zero. That is really the effort that Metro Denver Homeless Initiative um, has, uh, and it's a, a nationwide effort to end homelessness um, you know, nationally. So we are looking for getting to that functional zero um, position. And there are a lot of things that we need to do in order to be prepared to, to capture that information especially and to understand um, our unsheltered individuals by name, really. So a lot of work has been done along these lines to, to be able to do that. So in 2023, Douglas County was able to achieve the perfect scorecard, uh, which essentially, what does that mean, right? Um, there are 29 programmatic benchmarks that um, nationwide, you know, we look at to be able to determine if we are at functional zero. So we have to make sure that we have our um, program set up to meet all of those benchmarks to really have quality data. And in 2023, we were able to meet all of those benchmarks. So we do have a perfect scorecard. Um, and there are nine subregions in the Denver, you know, metro region that we're part of. Um, and Douglas County is one of five to reach quality data for veterans. So veterans is the first population that we were looking to hopefully to get to functional zero. Um, and 
for that population, we now know that we are at quality data. Um, and that means that for veterans of Douglas County, we've demonstrated that there's data reliability over at least a three month period. Um, and that we can show that we understand what the inflow of veterans is and the outflow of veterans. Um, so of those five that have reached that, uh, that is Douglas County, Adams County, City of Aurora, Boulder County, and the Tri-Cities area. Um, so we're happy to join that group. That's, that's an important step to me. Um, and our next step then that we hope to be um, that we hope to be letting you know about soon is that we uh, hope to reach functional zero for veterans um, within a pretty short short time frame. Um, so next next slide, please. Okay, uh, we want to talk a lot. Uh, we want to talk some about the grants that that we have been. Um, we have been uh, looking at and applying for. Um, it's really, we know, very important to have the resources in place to continue to provide these services. So uh, we know that, you know, we need to find those resources to continue to support our HEART team um, and even the expansion of HEART, as well as some of the other additional resources that our unsheltered individuals may need. Um, so we've been working very hard to identify grants for that. And... Uh, we have um, been successful in um, being awarded several different grants that are connected with providing those homeless services. Um, so we did receive an emergency, shelter, uh, emergency solutions grant uh, from the state of Colorado, and that was for 50000 to be able to provide hotel vouchers. Uh, those hotel vouchers are really only given to individuals who are directly coordinating with HART. Um, and in addition to that, when we have some extreme weather situations, uh, those are the type of, of vouchers that we would depend on to make sure that people are safe. Uh, we have also received uh, an award from the Transformational Homeless Response Grant, which supports HART. Uh, it's, it supports the ongoing um, operations for HART for the three units that we have currently and allows us to expand up to five units. So that'll allow us to um, expand the hours, and Tiffany is going to talk more about that, so I'll let her talk about that. But that is a uh, three-year grant. Uh, that was $1.6 million that was awarded um, to be able to ex expand and continue heart operations. Then we also have received word um, just recently that we uh, received another emergency solutions grant from the state of Colorado for 2023. Uh, we're not sure if that the funds could be coming either from emergency solutions or from Proposition 123 funds which um, I know you heard our housing authority talk about those additional funds. And we have access to those funds because all of the different jurisdictions decided to participate in that, um, in that process. So we're very thankful for that and want to report that we did receive a $50,000 award for homeless prevention. And I know we have talked about, and this kind of flows into next steps for us, but the prevention and diversion work group that is getting started within the next month, I believe. Um, and I want to say just a big shout out and big thank you to all of you on the work group, on the executive committee who have agreed to work on that committee. Um, I think that will be very important. That will help. That work group will provide input on um, how those emergency solutions grant funds are used for homeless prevention um, and help us do some program design and implementation for that. Uh, I think that also sets us up well so that we can do more along the lines of prevention and diversion um, and really help people from really getting into a situation where they're in an unsheltered situation. So I think that'll be very important, and we want to be really poised to be able to act um, quickly, 
but also thoughtfully. So uh, we also have um, a, uh, we have received notice that we are through the initial stages of the congressionally de uh, designated spending funding um, that will also allow uh, for the expansion of uh, HART. Um, and that's kind of, that's coming from the Department of Justice and um, would help kind of on the co-responder law enforcement side. So what we're looking at right, right now, is, as far as we know, is a, a $900,000 award for that, that will help for those additional three years. So a lot happening as far as funding coming in. And I have to really give um, just a tremendous shout out um, to the, the county staff who have worked very hard to put these grants together. Um, Rand Clark has done a tremendous job with this. Um, Melanie de Halicourt has done a wonderful job as well and several people on the community services team. So I'm up here presenting it, but they did all the work. <laughs> so, um, okay. Next slide, please. I'm also very happy to report that um, we do, we've talked about this a little bit. We'll be talking about this more as it kind of comes more into fruition. Uh, but in 2023, the Board of County Commissioners did decide to financially make a contribution towards the Aurora's um, Regional Navigation Center. Um, this center is, is gonna be very important for the metro area since it will be really providing 24 seven services, a campus of services available for those who are unsheltered. It will um, serve at least 500 individuals per day, can go up to 600 um, as, you know, in, we're in extreme weather conditions. So using additional beds, um, they'll be able to expand that. Um, it will be a low barrier center and um, it will have a, a wide array of on-site services available there. So, you know, a, a person who needs it can access anything from case management to employment, social services, uh, behavior and physical health, um, laundry, you know, um, um, a shelter, a place for their pets, all of that will be included. So we're very happy um, to be participating in that with Aurora, as well as Adams County, Arapahoe County, uh, and us, as I believe. So next steps on that, um, we are working on an intergovernmental agreement on the operations and um, construction of the Regional Navigation Center with Aurora. I expect to have that in front of the commissioners for approval in February. Uh, we are expecting that construction on that project will begin second quarter of this year um, and will be operational in um, 2025. So good news there. I think we are at the end of <laughs> our <laughs> um, of our presentation. Happy to answer any questions anybody might have. Well, another very humble staff member, but none of this would be possible without Jenny V's incredible hard work and investment in the Homeless Initiative as well. Um, you know, when we think about the, the end in mind, ultimately getting to that functional zero number, um, that's our target, that's our bullseye. Uh, starting with veterans, but hopefully extrapolating out to the larger population, our numbers are so low comparative to uh, the rest of the region, there's no reason that through all these partnerships, we can't continue to target towards that functional zero number. So hopefully more to come there, but really great information. Um, we'll transition now to uh, our guest, AD Works, who I'm really excited will be at the table with us. I think we often say that, you know, the best form of, oh, did you have a question? I'm yeah, so sorry, sorry, Marissa, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Marissa Harmon, Lone Tree City Council. I just uh, had a comment and a question. First, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to securing the grant funding. We all know in our different municipalities and at the county level how important it is to make sure we're accessing grant monies and that saves our taxpayer dollars. So huge thank you and, and that's really exciting. My question is, are we tracking how many engagements um, that the HART team is having with different unhoused individuals before they're receiving services, before they, 
I know in a certain presentation, there was a stat that said seven to eight um, encounters with our heart team could possibly have them agree to services. And I was just wondering if we're taking a track of that, that'd be a great, and, it, and you don't have to answer the question, but I think that would be a great metric to look at, especially uh, next year. So That's great. thanks so much. Great question. Thank you for that. Jen? Yeah. So if I'm understanding you correctly, it's, it's like how many engagement, how many times are they talking with people before that individual is willing to accept services? Um, they are definitely tracking how um, many um, engagements they have, so how many, many times they are, are talking with people. If we're not capturing, you know, how many before um, they start to accept services, I, I think that's something we could probably look at how we're, we're doing that. Tiffany, are, are we doing that specifically? Because I, I know that they are also capturing a lot of information in HMIS, but until they have individuals' names and information, um, sometimes that's a hard thing to track. But go ahead, Tiffany. Yeah, most of the time when um, an individual is wanting resources, um, they're willing to enroll in our homeless management information system database so we can start um, getting them connected to the appropriate resources, whether that's housing or mental health. Um, so there's... I wouldn't say there's about seven times before um, someone wants to engage with us. Um, it's pretty quickly when somebody is wanting services that they're willing to be enrolled in the system. But we can definitely track that in the future. That's great. And just a, a side note, but a really important one. Um, I think we saw, saw the number of homeless individuals or unhoused people by jurisdiction. And we are really thankful to have the municipal representation here um, specifically, I mean, I think we saw Lone Tree Highlands Ranch and Castle Rock um, as, as really having to take on a lot of that burden. So thank you for being here with us. Um, so with that, we will transition on to uh, AD Works. And I was about to say that we know the best form of welfare is a job, uh, you know, that self-sufficiency. So we're really thankful for the role that AD Works plays and the opportunity to partner with you uh, in greater detail to help uh, the unhoused get to self-sufficiency. Sasha? <laughs> and Sasha, I think, is a Parker resident, right? I you, am, yes. All right. So yes, have... and Emily's a Parker resident as well. Sasha is a Castle Rock resident. All Any right. other? I'm in Castle Pines. Castle Pines. So. Team Douglas County, I like yeah. it. Yeah, yes. <laughs> So we're very excited to be here today. My name is Sasha Easton, and I'm the director of Arapahoe Douglas Works. Next slide, please. Arapahoe Douglas Works connects job seekers to opportunities and jobs through an individualized and customized approach. And today, I'm joined by my colleagues who are gonna talk about our services to justice involved job seekers, those experiencing homelessness in our services in Douglas County. And so I'll introduce the team. These are the Arapahoe Douglas Works leaders who oversee our services in Douglas County. I have Emily Tapia, the Workforce Administrator, Sasha Larson, Programs Manager, Jamie Fisher, Business Services Manager, Sydney Goldich, Workforce Board and Agency Manager, and Andrea Barnum, Programs Manager. And I'll turn it over to Emily. Good morning, everyone. Next slide, please. So AD Works is the local operator of the public workforce system. <clears throat> so anyone who connects with our services is able to engage in the general career preparedness and job search resources, such as one-on-one -on -one career advising and planning, workshops such as emotional intelligence, resume, interviewing, financial literacy. And then additionally, we evaluate if an individual meets the criteria for eligibility for further programs, uh, support, including case management, supportive services, and additional funding. Next slide, please. 
So when it comes to those individuals with complex barriers or needs and their, cir their circumstances may involve being homeless at risk of losing housing or justice involvement or a combination of all of those factors, what does that look like? First, they connect with us directly through a variety of avenues or through a community partner referral. We have found that our virtual and phone service delivery and access in our multiple locations have mitigated some of those barriers to engage with us, such as transportation, child care, maybe some mental health needs as well. Once they reach us, we're evaluating their needs. They may have come to us after having gone through a layoff. They may be re-entering the workforce after time being a um, caregiver for a family member, or they may be entering the workforce for the first time. And so for that, in that way, we will provide our general resources right away and immediately help them with any way that we can. But we again evaluate on an individual human-centered design uh, to understand what their unique needs are, what their goals are, and what are those services and resources that we can provide and connect them to in the community to help them succeed. We are really focused on long-term successful outcomes. We don't want them to need to come back and see us in three months or six months, although they're welcome to. We want them to understand career pathways that will lead to self-sufficiency. We want them to um, be able to achieve their lifelong goals and be productive members of the community through a holistic response. Next slide, please. So with that pathway, once we start to identify their individual needs and circumstance and we understand what their goal is, we don't prescribe their goals to them or the services that they must utilize, we find out what they would like to prioritize and what resources can help them get to where they are, knowing that they have to take those steps themselves. They are creating action plans. We are a support system to help them do that. So some of our programs um, include both funding through the Department of Labor and Human Services. And they might come to us because they are eligible through receiving public assistance or low income, of course, being justice involved, homeless. We have specific veteran services available as well. And in any of these areas, we have subject matter expert staff who are well connected in the community and understand the way to help those individuals navigate our services as best possible. This also includes case management, support for job retention, so once they gain employment, we don't leave them there. We want to make sure that they are successful and that um, we are coaching and guiding and helping them. Supportive services might include uh, short-term rental assistance or mortgage assistance so that they don't lose housing while they're working to gain employment. Additionally, we know that I need to earn money now, and so we work for um, opportunities to train and upskill through work-based learning and placements where they're earning and learning and gaining a career in the same at at the same time. We also provide collaboration with community partners, financial counseling, and we utilize a cliff effect tool because we know if you're receiving public assistance and you start earning money that then you are no longer eligible, it might not be enough to keep yourself self-sufficient and you might end up in that bucket again of needing public assistance. So we're working with them to understand how my income changes and how I can take that step forward to full self-sufficiency. Next slide, please. So what that looks like for a customer, uh, this customer, Paul, came to us directly into our resource centers. He was experiencing homeless. As we investigated his needs, we also found there was a transportation is issue and disability. So we knew that there were several factors that Paul needed to address before he could begin working and gaining employment. So we were able to work with a variety of partners, such as the Douglas County Heart Team, the Catholic Charity and the Rock Church, and then internally we have a disability program navigator who helps connect that individual to work opportunities and resources. So with this, it's about getting that individual to stability. And so we were able to do that for Paul to get the housing so that he could then work on training, upskilling, and gaining employment. Next slide, please. 
Additionally, that might look a little bit different with David. David came as a referral from the HEART team, and the HEART team was connecting him to stable housing, so we knew that um, barrier was being addressed. We were able to connect him with Grow with Google Certificate Program for Cybersecurity. So this is an example of where we can support someone with training and upskilling so that they can then be more eligible for careers that provide a solid career pathway in our area. I'll pass it on to Sasha Larson to speak about our Justice Involved programs. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, we can move to the next slide, please. Um, so we do have a couple of programs that are specific to justice involved individuals, and one of those goes pairs very well with Nicole's presentation. Um, our partnership with um, Douglas County Justice Center with the Douglas County Justice Center Collaborative Program for Reintegration. Um, we partner <clears throat> with the Justice Center to provide individuals that are currently still incarcerated um, with services to help prepare them for their release um, with their job search. Some of the things that we offer are pre-employment workshops, which Emily touched on, but um, we have kind of a, a series that we do with um, interviewing emotional intelligence and pursue your passion. We also provide um, individuals with one-on-one -on -one individualized career coaching, and then we do um, help them create a resume, which will be uploaded to a flash drive so that they have when they're, that they can take with them when they are released, they have their, their resume in hand. Um, from July of 2022 to December of 2023, we've served almost 400 individuals in that program. Um, uh, this partnership also does allow for us to collaborate um, and provide input for the Douglas County Sheriff's Office reintegration meetings um, regarding um, workforce trends and any feedback that we receive from the individuals we're serving. And then um, we also, for this particular program, as well as a lot of other Douglas County services that we provide are um, in kind by, um, in kind through Arapahoe Douglas Works through a lot of our discretionary grant grants. Next slide, please. <laughs> our other justice involved program is our Pathway Home program. And this one, again, also we're um, connecting with individuals while they are still incarcerated. Um, and then we are continuing to work with them upon release. And then also we provide follow-up services for up to one year after they gain employment. The goal of the program is to reduce uh, recidivism um, through the state of Colorado by 10% within one year after release. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the services that we provide are individualized case management services, which Emily touched on on one of her slides as well. And then um, as that relates to Douglas County, um, about 10% of the caseload for what we served uh, for the Pathway Home Grant were um, residents of Douglas County. And we were able to expend a little over $7,000 in rental assistance for, to help um, mitigate eviction. Next slide, please. And then here is a, another success story um, of a, a, an individual that um, had justice involvement as a uh, barrier to employment, as well as a few other things of, such as experiencing homeless off and on, um, ha having a documented disability. And then she was a single mom of three who did not have stable um, employment or uh, self-sufficient employment working in a warehouse. She came to us looking for a new career path and was interested in the IT field. So we were able to enroll her into our run grant um, and which was able to get her into our, the CompTIA A plus certification class. She was also a SNAP recipient. So we were able to refer to the Employment First program so that she can get some additional supportive services. When we followed up with her a couple of months later, she was very, very happy to report that she was doing very well in her training class, getting all A's and, um, really enjoying herself with that and that she expressed that Employment First was able to provide assistance with clothing, um, personal items and some transportation, which she was very grateful for. And overall, she just was very confident and very excited about um, her getting the, having the ability to start working towards her goals. And now I will hand it over to Jamie. Okay, next slide. Um, so this slide here represents the host of services that we do offer to businesses. Today, I'm going to focus on work-based learning and strategic partnerships. So for work-based learning, we have placed 40 Douglas County residents into work-based learning opportunities since July of 2022. Um, and we also wanted to note that Arapahoe Douglas Works um, was also recognized by the Colorado Department of Human Services as being the first employment first provider nationally to place um, an individual in a work-based learning opportunity. And one of our first placements was a Douglas County resident. Next slide. 
Um, so strategic partnerships, um, first I wanted to highlight a collaboration called Tours for Teachers, and this is a picture of Tours for Teachers out at Lockheed Martin Space. Um, but this is a collaboration between Arapahoe Douglas Works, Douglas County School District, the Castle Rock Chamber, and Arapahoe Community College at Sturm. It takes teachers on industry tours um, to learn about career pathways, entry-level jobs, and in-demand credentials. Another partnership I wanted to highlight today was our involvement as the convener of the aerospace sector partnership. Um, many participating employers are housed along the C-470 corridor and also employ Douglas County residents, as I'm sure you know. Um, because of our strong involvement in aerospace, we have placed um, 40 residents into WIOA mm -hmm. trainings in the aerospace industry. So um, that is a big focus of ours. And I will turn it over to Sydney next. Next slide, please. So this slide highlights some data points that really showcase outcomes of the services we provide. As you can see, um, through our grant funding sources, we have provided nearly $720,000 in funding to participants in Douglas County. And with the services we provided, we provided um, over 25 um, services with um, nearly 8,000 of those being virtual. And through our services, we also provided services to customers experiencing homelessness. And in total, we provided 212 of those services to customers who identified that they were experiencing homelessness. And of those 212 services, 31 services provided were to customers reporting both homelessness and um, justice involvement. And in addition to that, for justice-involved customers that we provided service to, where we provided 600, over 600 services to customers who were justice-involved. And I'll turn over to Andrea. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, during that same review, during that same period, there was um, nearly 92,000 in supportive services provided to those um, participants in human services grants. Um, those supportive services could include anything from transportation to a work-based learning or to a job. Um, it could include um, a rental deposit to help someone become housed um, stably. And then it could also be books and supplies for training or whatever else that assessed need would be. Um, whenever we're assessing participants for supportive services, we look on a case-by-case -case basis, um, always trying to provide that customized, individualized case management um, to meet their needs. At the same time, one thing we really do very well at AD Works is we co-enroll participants into multiple funding streams and multiple grants programs to better, best meet their needs, because we know, you know one program might cover one supportive service, training, work-based learning, and another might provide something else that they need. Um, Next slide, please. So this is a lot of information that we've thrown at you guys in a short period of time. Um, so if there's anything else that you guys would like to um, hear from us, from your agencies, or um, to expand upon in the future, um, please reach out to us, any of us, um, to schedule presentations. Um, there's so much more that we could dive into for each of our programs and, and grants um, to talk about how we serve um, our participants experiencing homelessness or that are justice involved or um, that are receiving uh, uh, services from from AD Works as a job seeker. So, next slide, please. Okay, so we want to open it up now to questions. If anyone has any. Um. I have been, had the pleasure and honor of being on your board for uh, going into six years now, and I'm always so pleased to hear about the real suite of services um, and options um, for uh, you know upskilling, reskilling, retraining, um, and job placement, and the other, many other um, things that you provide. The missing gap in my mind, and maybe you can help answer this for me, is if. Um, and I always call it the next door neighbor test. You know, if you were to go down the street here in Castle Rock and talk to a single mom that recently lost um, her job and has, you know, childcare issues, would she, if I said, hey, do you, have you heard of AD Works? What do you think her response would be? And how do you, in your hypotheticals, 
connect people to that initial entry point of that's where I need to go to get, get services? What does that look like? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and the million dollar question we ask ourselves every day, I think the challenge for us is our funding does not allow for paid marketing. So it really is a ground grassroots approach to get that networking and outreach to community partners, to businesses, um, and to partnerships like K through 12, post-secondary. Um, we are as known as we hope to be, certainly. So I think the answer to your question, Commissioner Layden, is it depends. Um, we've really tried to have a strategic outreach. Sasha's team has a whole outreach team that connects with partners, um, goes to schools, does presentations, but we know that we need to reach a broader audience. And so that's why we're here today. And so we encourage you, if you'd like us to come to talk to your organization, to your, your son or daughter school, we're happy to do that. And and we know it's, it's a... Um, an ongoing effort um, and we also welcome suggestions as well so you have our contact information if you think that there's something we could do to make more inroads but i think it's a work in progress certainly well i think you just being here my late father would would always say 90 percent of life is just showing up so thank you for being here i think part of it is you know if you haven't met tiffany uh the the director of our heart team that's probably the best initial contact is ensuring that as Tiffany and her team um, is engaging with people that are unhoused, that they can immediately plug in and introduce to AD Works as a resource. Um, I'm also thinking about this amazing uh, woman to my left that just said she got 489,000 impressions uh, this last year. I just wonder if that is a potential synergy between what we do from a communication standpoint um, and, and the public awareness around AD Works. I would like to also offer that we have a marketing outreach and engagement task force through our workforce board, and it's open beyond board members. It's open to community participation, community organizations, and we are getting strategies for that as far as how can we connect? Uh, we were recently in the media through CBS, and how can we utilize our social media ch uh, channels? How can we expand the word? How can we improve our uh, partner referral process and knowledge of our services to our partners? So there's a lot of work, and we've identified that as one of the task force areas for our board. That's great. Well, we're pleased to be a partner. Um, questions? Mike Bohemus. Yeah, just a quick question. First off, I just want to thank you guys. We work with you, and it's always a pleasure working with you guys, and it's it's great work that you guys do. Uh, as you were talking, and, and this kind of links right into what you guys were saying here, is I guess my first question is, is what is your capacity now for increase based on the current size of your team? Do you still have the ability to, to take on more, or are you kind of at that capacity? I, I could start, and then if anybody has anything else to add. So we've seen a huge influx of need in the community. So in our, just the last year, our utilization of services increased by 77%. Wow. However, you know, funding levels don't necessarily match that increase in demand. So we do try to be really innovative and creative in braiding of funds, um, applying for new grant opportunities. So that's another opportunity for all of you. Think of us if you're applying for grants, we'd like to be a partner. But I think that that's something we've all tr also tried to do with staffing is we've made a dedicated effort to cross train. So no matter who you engage with at Arapahoe Douglas Works, they can navigate you and have a no wrong door approach. So we're we're doing our best, but you know I I I think my staff would say many of them are at capacity. So I do want to, you know, be. Um, true to that as well. So we're trying to look for those efficiencies, but not compromise that service delivery and customer service. Thank you. And I guess the second part of that was just as as I meet with a lot of the pastors in the area, I was just thinking it may be an opportunity. Um, as we work with you, it's been great, but I know there's other churches as well where people are coming into the churches and not necessarily to Douglas County Human Services. And so um, to have that direct connection to say, hey, uh, we can help you get a job through AD Works, uh, but I don't want to increase or overload 
uh, you guys. But but I think there is an opportunity there. I don't know if it's through the the lead pastors because they seem to have a lot going on and it often doesn't get past them. But I think there's a way we can figure out to to connect with the churches in the region and and increase your footprint there. And so we do welcome those connections. So I don't, you know, I don't want to discourage anybody from connecting with us because we do want to broaden that outreach and impact. And just for everyone to know, they are co-located at the Department of Human Services. So if someone is receiving SNAP benefits or someone is receiving child care um, or any um, TANF and, and child welfare, we have case management set up through the Department of Human Services with AD Works. So they are on site. We do also, um, we're, we're located um, at the Parker Task Force every other Wednesday. We're hoping to, Dan, eventually get at the Senior Center. We'd love to have some time there as well when it opens. Mm -hmm. um, so that's also something we're always open to looking at different locations to best serve our participants and meet them where they're at, because we do know transportation. Um, it, that could be a factor as well, as well as other things that you know, might be better served in the community, right? Great. I think we have a question from Aaron White. Yep, I have a quick question. I know your presentation was focused on people experiencing homelessness and justice involved, but um, you have a stat on total services provided. Uh, do you know the total number of Douglas County residents that were served in this time period? 404. So the 404 number is overall Douglas County residents? Correct. Okay, thank you. Great. Well, I know we're, we've had so much rich content today, but we are running short on time. We have about 15 minutes left, uh, maybe 15 to 20 minutes. Um, any other questions on this before we, we move on? Okay, again, a huge thanks to AD Works. We really appreciate you guys. Okay, okay. Okay, so with that, um, I, I think we'll do a, uh, if it's okay with Mike Wade, um, I think we're being asked to do the photo op at the end of the meeting. If you can hang tight, uh, we are gonna move on to a, a brief update from Tiffany Marcito on Heart. Yes, and maybe before you. we do that, I see the CCOR cares. Did we wanna do the update from CCOR or are we pushing that to the end as well? I think we could do the update from CCOR um, okay. and then uh, we'll do the check distribution at the end. Okay. And then we'll go to Tiffany. Oh, I see. Okay, great. Welcome. Hi, my name is Bree Dilly. I'm the executive director at CCOR Cares. I've been asked to keep this short, so I will try very hard to do that. Um, for those of you who don't know, CCOR Cares has been a part of this community f since the 1990s, even before we incorporated as a nonprofit in 2006. And we really work to address the needs of food insecurity in this area. So we serve all of Douglas County as well as Arapahoe and Elbert counties. We have three primary programs that we do that, um, that we accomplish that work. One is our free food market, which is at our brick and mortar location up in Parker. And it's a food pantry, but it's set up just like a grocery store. So people who are experiencing food insecurity can come and they can shop for themselves. They can choose what food makes the most sense for themselves and their families. We are really big on dignity as an approach in everything that we do. Um, and so one of the ways that we do that is through the ability to choose the food that people um, take home for themselves and their families. So that's one of our, our big programs, our flagship program. But then we also have um, a mobile market. So a handful of years ago, we were like, well, it's kind of hard to get to us sometimes. We're not on a good bus line. How can we get out into the communities uh, that can't get to us? And so we, we outfitted a beverage truck. The sides roll up and it's set up just like our market. So uh, we will roll into communities and they shop around the truck. So we strategically focus on senior housing, um, low income housing and college campuses for that outreach. And then our third major program is our Food for Thought program. So that is really focused on um, elementary, some middle school aged kiddos who are experiencing food insecurity, who are really reliant on the schools to provide that food service for them and then struggle to get through the weekend. So we give those kids a bag of food to kind of help cover that gap. 
Between our three major programs, we currently serve as many as 3,000 households in a given week. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty large operation. And in addition to the work that we do, we also partner with a lot of other agencies, nonprofit, Douglas County, um, churches, things like that, to try to, to kind of piecemeal different needs together, but also to resource other organizations that may not have the same sort of infrastructure. So um, I know Family Tree is a big partner here. We, we resource their food pantry um, and do some different things like that. But today I'm gonna hit on some of the stuff that we do with the Heart Team. You can go to the next slide. We started working with the Heart Team in late 2022 um, as we heard about this initiative. And... <laughs> Can we advance the slide? Yeah, IT somewhere. Oh man, I'm gonna have to remember this off the top of my head, huh? Okay. <laughs> um, well, we started working with the Heart Team in late 2022 and reached out and just said, you know, how can we partner? How can we help? And the biggest way that we do that is through uh, these kind of resource bags that we provide to the heart team. So in those bags, there's usually um, different hygiene items like soap or hand sanitizer, um, drinks, Gatorade, water, those sorts of things, and then shelf stable food items, snacks, uh, jerky, chips, that sort of stuff, but is also protein, tuna, chicken, um, and then pop top canned goods as well. Currently, we give about, um, I can't remember what we said, Debbie, like 20 to 30 bags every couple weeks to the heart team. Um, Debbie uh, is my colleague over here and she really oversees this program. She should be doing this presentation and not me. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so we resource the heart team with that on a regular basis and there it is. Um, Oh, and then additionally, we also uh, work as, as really a referral partner with HEART. And so they refer, refer folks to us, we refer folks to them. Um, we've actually seen an increase in the number of people experiencing homelessness coming into our food pantry to the point that we've even had to adjust some of our, our policies to allow for folks to come in more frequently who um, lack access to transportation so that they can come in more frequently and take just what they can carry. Um, and then the next slide I think says that we've we've given about 500 bags to the heart team since we started working with them. Mm -hmm. I think the number is actually like 496, but I also like to round up. Mm -hmm. um, and then additionally, we provide extra resources as they become available to us that we can give to the heart team that makes sense. Things like can openers, um, backpacks, sleeping bags, hand warmers, socks, those sorts of things, anything that we can um, that we can collect, that we can conjure up for our heart team that would be beneficial to the people experiencing homelessness in this community. Uh, we're super thankful for this partnership and for this initiative, and thanks for giving me some of your time today. I'm, I'll open it up for questions if anybody has any. Well, wow, what a, what a tremendous partnership. And we've been a huge fan of Secor Cares for a long time. So Bree, thank, thank you. you for that. How about a huge round of applause for Secor? Thank you. 100 bags. Commissioner Thomas. So Bree, thank you for being here. I was invited to go have a tour at Secor maybe a year ago. Mm -hmm. And what I felt when I walked in really was about dignity, that I didn't feel that I was in there because I was needy and you were there to just help me. It was a very welcoming environment. There's even a big thing of flowers when you walk out that you could take flowers, fresh flowers, home with you. Um, there's even a gentleman there who will help you with your budget and help you get back on your feet and do financial planning. And a couple of times I've been there, I've seen the heart team there loading up to help people. And I just want to know how much you to know, and you know this, how much I support you. I, I've put in my newsletter that I contribute monthly and I encouraged everybody else to contribute monthly because I have seen the direct correlation of where the, the things you have go out the door to help others. So thank you for being here and thank you for what you do for all of our community. Thank you, Commissioner Thomas. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add to that that you know, I know that this initiative is specifically focused on our unhoused community, but um, 
that's not the whole picture of those who are struggling here in Douglas County. So we really see, I, I often say that we kind of serve the full spectrum of poverty, whether it's people experiencing homelessness or people who are Douglas County educators um, or otherwise, you know, middle class folks. So it, it really uh, spans wide and, and um, yeah, poverty touches a lot more people here in Douglas County than we often think. Thank you for that comment, Commissioner Thomas. I appreciate that. Uh, any additional comments for CCOR? Okay. Um, well, with that, uh, we do have the distinguished uh, director of our Douglas County Community Foundation, Mike Wade, here to distribute some checks, I believe. Did we want to do Tiffany's first? Or do we um, want to? Go ahead and make the, the make distribution. The, okay. Sure. And then we'll do the picture. Just want to make sure get the, with everything goes yeah. Sure. So just as a quick update, before I turn around and give Bree a check, I think she would just went back and sat back down. Um, just to give everybody kind of a, a reminder update about Douglas County Community Foundation and how we interact specifically with this program. It's our honor to be the grant manager of the funds of the Douglas Has Heart program. And as a reminder, Ed, to those watching and, and learning about this program for the first time, 100% of the donations that come in, 100% are distributed back out to the organizations who are working in our community to help with uh, the homeless situation. And in fact, it's, it's our pleasure and honor to absorb the costs of managing this program. So it's one of the few times that when someone, uh, one of the questions I get quite a bit is, you know, how much of this is going to actually be hitting the streets? 100% of the funds that are distributed hit the streets. So uh, as a reminder to people, the way it works is as donations come in through the website or mailed in to us, once the fund hits $2,500, that next quarter we do a distribution to a list of organizations that work in the homeless situation here in Douglas County. So with that, it's my honor to be able, on behalf of the, uh, the donors who have contributed, and as a little side note, those donations have ranged from $25 to $1,000. So when you look at the almost $9,000 that have been raised in this program, these are people who are legitimately taking little pieces of their treasure and helping our community. And on behalf of them and of our board of directors for Douglas County Community Foundation, it's my honor to present this check to Bree. Right. <clears throat> Fantastic. And I, I know Drew is in the back. I don't know if uh, we have a photo that we're having set up or if we're, would you like us to do that at the, at the very end? Okay, we'll go where you ask us to go. Thank you, Drew. And with that, we'll go to Tiffany. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, so I just wanted to thank everybody who has partnered with our team this last year and since we started. Um, we couldn't do this without our faith-based organizations, nonprofit organizations, um, Douglas County programs, regional programs. So thank you all for all your collaboration. Um, like Wendy Holmes said earlier, it does take a village to help um, those who are unhoused. So we, we really appreciate the, the collaboration with everyone. Um, like Jen said, we received grant money to be able to expand our team. Um, we're adding two new units that will provide coverage on Saturdays and Sundays, um, along with extending our operational hours into the later evening. Um, we're in final interviews this week and hope to have the new members on board in the beginning of February. So we look forward to introducing them to everyone um, in February. So thank you. I kept it short and sweet. Wow, that is, that is great news. All towards the goal of getting to functional zero, and you've done a great job of that. Any questions for the hard team? Okay. Well, and, and just going back to Mike Wade, uh, part of our Handouts Don't Help campaign is about you know, redirecting generosity. Um, from busy intersect sections, which are not a safe place for people to receive and ask for, for funds, to the Community Foundation. I'm glad that our citizens have picked up on that. So, okay, well, with that, um, let's go ahead and gather for a photo. Drew, where, where do you want us? And Mike Wade's getting to be known for the big check. He's the big check guy. We don't have public comments. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Do you want us standing? Do you want? 
Okay. And I think it's, it's all of us here, guys. So let's all get up and uh, join Mike. Right in the center. Bree, thanks for being here with us. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, this is really cool. Yeah, I need to come by for a tour, it sounds yes, like. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Guys, come on in. Don't come on in. Look at all of a sudden when the camera comes out, everyone gets shy. You guys spend your time and energy on this initiative. You need to be up here. <laughs> this this check wouldn't happen without you guys. Okay, squeeze in, you squeeze in. Up here. So we can stack this. Mike, can you go up here? You are so cool. Thanks, man. <laughs> and the hair's looking really good these days. <laughs> I was thinking cut it all off, you know. Don't do that. You go back and forth. Um, yeah, you know, a lot of people go clean shaven for the new year. Oh, the beard will never. Mm. <laughs> I never on the beard. Well, I go. The beard goes for charity. That's right. Mm. That's right. Okay. But outside of charity, it stays. Is that St. Baldrick's? Yeah. Is that the yeah? We did a uh, almost two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. Dan and Jen, would you guys join us? <laughs> I thought Jen said no. <laughs> One of these days, we'll get the reintegration deputies and the team to be at the table with us. Next meeting. All right, awesome. Awesome. way to go, guys. Thank you very Appreciate much. it, Bree. Yep. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. And you guys can take this one home. Oh. You know, put it up on the wall. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Well, I am going to do my level best to uh, still wrap up on time. I was told that we don't have any public comment, but I do want to double check uh, in the room or online. Is there any public comment? Anyone here with us that would like to comment? Okay, anybody online? Okay, I'm not seeing any. So let me just uh, make sure that uh, for the members that are here with us today, any, any comments from our executive uh, committee or working group here? Any thoughts, concerns, considerations as we enter the new year? I wanna make sure we have more time to hear from you guys because you're spending a lot of time here. I wanna make sure that you guys uh, have, a, have a moment. But okay, seeing none. Um, I there, will not. There was one person online. Oh, okay. Um, hold, hold on just a sec. Uh, that basically just uh, was thanking everyone for the work that was being done. Oh. So want to acknowledge that and ap appreciate that. Well, thank you. Thanks for being here with us. Um, so with that, it looks like we are going to finish on time. With one minute left, I'll just uh, echo the sentiments of the individual online. Uh, what an incredible honor to partner with each of you. You are friends and colleagues, uh, and I'm really excited for 24. So enjoy the rest of your day.